Hello everyone, uh, welcome uh, to our lecture tonight, part of the Norwegian Institute lecture series. We have a, a great honor tonight and a personal pleasure to me to have uh, Dr. Xena Telemandu here with us tonight, who will be presenting about her research on this amazing site of Sophos on Andros. Uh, I will let uh, Mr. Uh, Ioannis Kiriakou uh, introduce uh, uh, Mr. Lavan. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, my name is Yanis Kiriakou. In my capacity as not only Greek lawyer, but mainly and primarily as lover of antiquities and resident of Andros Island in the Cyclades complex of islands in Greece, I am this evening pleased to introduce to you Mrs. Christina Televantu, archaeologist and director of the excavation at Strophilus Andrus, who throughout decades of dedicated work has managed to reveal a unique large Neolithic fortified settlement, providing new and useful information in regard to the Aegean Neolithic age. Mrs. Televantu is going to initiate you into the magic of the Neolithic settlement that flourished during the final Neolithic period 4500 to 3200 BC in the Stophilus area of Andros. Major architectural achievements comprise a number of communal projects, such as its fortification wall, a sanctuary, an open area destined for cult practice, and the Mechelon. Extensive and dense rock art representations are also the works of a collective character on the basis of a central communal planning with symbolic, geometric, and pictorial motifs, as well as larger narrative scenes, e.g. flotilla of ships, human figures in hunting scenes, jackals hunting deer. More than 120 depictions of ships executed in public space and representing the community's prevailing symbol, ships executed in public space and representing the community's prevailing symbol attest to the settlement's chief maritime character and suggest intense maritime activities, shipbuilding, seafaring, trade, fishing, which, under community control, most probably constituted Stofila's main source of wealth that sustained a powerful settlement. There is also an abundance of high-quality finds testified, e.g. pottery, stone and bone implements, figurines, jewellery, and the use of advanced technology, e.g. metalwork, stonework. The overall evidence indicates that Strophilus was a thriving proto-urban settlement of maritime character, which undoubtedly played an important role within a wider network of smaller and or similarized settlements during the late Neolithic period, expanding the horizons of Cycladic and generally the Aegean prehistory and iconography. It demonstrates that during this period, an advanced culture took shape in the Aegean with large organized maritime societies and similar settlements of early proto urban features that presuppose the existence of a model for hierarchical society which laid the way into the subsequent cultural developments of the Aegean Middle and Late Bronze Age. For those of you related to the archaeological field, with Mrs. Christina de Levandu is well known and does not require particular inst introductions. Suffice to say, for the purpose of this evening's lecture, Mrs. de Levandu has served as member of the archaeological service of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture between 1979-2011, effort of antiquities of Cyclades, with a background of numerous excavations of prehistoric and classical sites in a number of islands, e.g. Andros, Delos, Milos, Thera, Samos. Supervisor of extensive archaeological sites, e.g. Ipsili on Andros, and the Acropolis of Ios Andreas and Siphnos, for which presented with the Europa Nostra 2012 award. Member of the Archaeological Society at Athens and director of three major excavations, the Neolithic settlement at Stophilus on Andros, the Acropolis of Ayos Andreas on Siphnus and Ipsilion Andros. Holder of doctorate from the National Kabbalistic University of Athens, the Criterion Theory, the War Paintings of the West House, has given a number of lectures and published numerous papers, announcements and studies. Curator of Museum Exhibitions, Archaeological Museum of Paleopolis on Andros, Museum of Prehistoric Theory, Parts of War Paintings, Archaeological Collection of Anathe. I would like to thank the Norwegian Institute for giving me the opportunity to introduce to you Mrs. Televant with her work at Stofilus, and particularly the head director of the Institute, Mrs. Jorn Oppland, who unfortunately is not with us tonight owing to heavy commitments, 
an archaeologist Zarko Tankusik, head of the archaeological section of the Institute and general coordinator of this evening's lecture. I would also like to reveal my intention to present today's lecture at my summer house in Andros during the course of the summer, providing also the participants with the opportunity to visit the site at Stofilas and experience the magic of this unique Neolithic settlement, which incidentally is one of the oldest Neolithic settlements discovered in Europe. And I'm sure that Mrs. Fedevanto will be more than pleased to contribute in this connection. I would now like to welcome Mrs. Fedevanto for her inspired lecture. Mrs. Fedevanto would be thereafter pleased to reply to any of your kind questions and or queries. Mrs. Fedevanto. Thank you very much for your kind words. Also, I would like to thank the Norwegian Institute at Athens for this invitation. The origins of prehistoric navigation in contact with the Aegean Islands are documented as early as the final, final Paleolithic period, 10 millennium BC. This is also documented by the transport of obsidian from Milos to various parts of Greece, such as the Frank the Cave in the Peloponnese from, from as early as the 7th century BC. The ability of seafaring and the subsequent early trade of products resulted in the mainland's interest towards the Aegean and gradually led on to the inhabitation of the islands. The islands were inhabited systematically during the Neolithic period as it is evidenced by surface finds, remains of installation, settlements, and cemeteries. Common evidence <coughs> from these areas indicates that communication, exchange of products, as well as interaction in art and technology took place. Cicades, due to their location in the central Aegean, certainly played a key role in maritime communication as well as in the formation of the Neolithic Aegean. This is further confirmed by the large, unique, fortified Neolithic settlement of Strophilus on Andros. Andros, strategically yeah. located near mainland Greece and Attica, is a natural bridge, one of the man's first steps into Aegean. It is also an important hub and port in the Neolithic sea routes, not only for the transport of goods, but also for the transmission of technology and ideas between the Cyclades, the mainland, Euboea, and the Northeast Aegean. Its importance grew in the late Neolithic period when mining <coughs> began in the Laureatic, Laplatiki, Merenda. Furthermore, Andros, the second largest Cycladic island, has important natural characteristics that are ideal for systematic habitation. Its, re is re its rich sources of water and sufficient arable land favor agriculture and animal husbandry, ensuring survival as well as the improvement of living standards. The rich vegetation provided timber, the raw material for the construction of seacoing vessels, an important element for fishing, and more importantly, the development of the sea trade. <coughs> Surface finds from the north part of the island suggest that during the late Neolithic I period, there were limited and occasional activities such as hunting, fishing, or agricultural work. During the next period, the final Neolithic, 
Andros experienced great and rapid growth. <coughs> Three settlements have been identified so far. Strophilas, Vraiokastro, a middle-sized settlement, and Mikroyali, the smaller and the only one in the east side of the island. Also, it appears that there were smaller settlements in other locations, location, e.g. at Rethi and Vraiokastro, south of Strophilas. <coughs> In the center of the west coast of Andros, on the Strophilus Plateau in 1992, a large, unique fortified Neolithic settlement was discovered that yielded new important information which changed radically the already known archaeological data for the Neolithic age in the Cyclades and in the wider region. Cape Strophilus is a naturally fortified location. Easy access to the settlement is possible only from the inland. In the north of the settlement, there are two natural harbors, while a stream provided drinking water. It controls both the, both the sea routes and the south part of the island, as it is located in an extremely <coughs> important strategic position and surveys the area from Attica and Eupia to Syros, Paros, and Naxos. The settlement seems to have been founded at the late Neolithic I period on the cultural horizon of Telia and Salyagos and flourished during the final Neolithic period. Its growth is affiliated with the beginning of mining in the Loreotaic Merenda as it is participated in the transport of oil. The extent of Strophilus is estimated at 25 to 30 acres, covering the plateau and, the, and an equal size area to the <coughs> west, and thus is the largest Neolithic settlement of the Aegean Islands. Strophilus fortification system is the oldest known so far, dating at the final Neolithic. This suggests, suggests that the already known fortifications in the Cyclades during the at early secondary <coughs> two and three periods and in the wider Aegean region could suggest precursory forms. The vulnerable the vulnerable north side of the settlement is protected by an impressive strong <coughs> defensive well wall with three rudimentary curved bastions. The wall is preserved to, to a height of approximately two meters and is estimated to have a total height of at least four meters tall. A large bastion protects the gate at the west end. The midpoint of the wall forms the inside is wide from the inside is wider in the lower part and curved at one end, therefore forming a type of semi deron which probably served for the easier mobility of the warriors. Thus, the wall gives an overall picture of the serious risk of attacks or population movements during the, this period in the Aegean. Furthermore, the wall protected the entire promontory which could accommodate flocks and herds for a long period of time. The architectural planning of the settlement seems to have generated from, the, from an initial spatial planning as is documented by architectural elements. The wall, whose location was imposed by defensive reasons, determine the planning of the areas inside and outside the settlement. While in combination with walls, it appeared that the different use of the areas was defined. <coughs> outside of the settlement and parallel to the lower level of the fortification wall, lies a wall forming an enclosure which was perhaps initially part of a complex system, defense system. <laughs> this defines area one, an area of 1,200 square meters 
probably an open-air worship place with a great number of rock art representations. The protected area within the settlement was divided into at least two areas, area two and three, with a strong partition wall inherent to the wall and building zeta. The smallest northeast area two seems to have been intended for important and or public buildings related to religious and administrative activities of the community, such as Complex Zeta, <coughs> the Sanctuary, Building Vita, Megaron, Upside 1, 2A, B, and possibly res residences of dis di distinguished <coughs> members of the community. At the larger Area 3, the rest of the settlement is developed. The two areas will communicate it through the partition wall, possibly near, near, the entra near an entrance to building Vita Medellin. <laughs> this spatial planning, and especially the formation of the fortification, determined from the natural outset, also determined the available wall-protected area and thus defined the formation of a dense urban tissue. The delimited space did not prevent the construction of large buildings, upside and rectangular in plan, carefully constructed, mainly with two or more rooms. The thickness of the external walls, usual 60 to 80 centimeters, suggests that the existence of an upper story. The walls are constructed of flat field stones and clay binder. The floors are, are of packed clay, and it seems that the roofs were flat and covered by stone slabs. A large-sized building, built in Zita, inherent to the wall at the crucial point in Area 2, may have been related with the defense of the settlement, and especially with the protection of the public buildings. Building Gamma, in Area 3, has five rooms and may consist of two residences. Residences. So far, eight upsidal buildings have been unearthed. Three of them, upsidal one, upside one, two A and two B, have joined walls, thus forming the shape of a daisy. The rest and building Vita, first face of the megaron, appear to have been intended. Upside one is one of the best preserved. It is divided into two parts by a transfer, transfer wall with a door in the center. Strophilus' upside buildings have a well redesigned layout of the type, demonstrating its early widespread use. The Neolithic house Q at Rahman in Thessaly appears to be contemporary. As far as the chronological phases are concerned, two main phases of the settlement have been documented. Phase A is placed at late Neolithic one period, and phase B at the final Neolithic with four successive building phases in the thick dis disaster level one meter high, which seems to date of a phase before the last one. This level extends in a large area along the wall both internally and externally. This stratum contains various finds and building material throw, thrown, thrown in haphazardly as an apothecary. <coughs> inside the fortification wall, there is a inside the fortification wall, there is a large curve wall that seems to set its boundaries to the west. Also, it covered part of a, the defensive wall Chemideron and was the level on which the upside fall four was erected. The high concentration of objects and how facade the way in which they are scattered without any provision for sorting val valuable or important items indicate that the settlement was severely damaged by an unknown cause. Obviously, in order for the settlement to return quickly to its normal state, waste material was 
hurriedly cleared the way and deposited in des designated points, thus forming the disaster level. The sanctuary is located in the center of Area 2. It probably was one of the most important community places <laughs> since phase A in the nucleus of the public buildings area during phase B. At early phases, an area of approximately 70 square meters of the sanctuary filled with rock art representations could be considered as a centerpiece of an open air worship area, a status which made it to subsequent architectural elements. <coughs> At phase A, B, A, first phase of the sanctuary, the area is defined to the east of the upside down building 5, which it may have had direct access to. It appears that the area has remained an open air sanctuary for a long time until the third <laughs> building phase BC. During phase BB, second phase of the sanctuary, access will be made possible through the central section of the new erector daisy shaped complex of the upside down buildings 1, 2A, and 2B. The next phase, BC, third phase of the sanctuary, marked the beginning of major changes. In the south, in the south erected an impressive edifice, the upside down building Vita. Its, uh, its central room, it could, it could communi communicate with the open air worship place. It seems that gradually, and relative to the growing prosperity of the settlement, this formation of the area did not satisfy the aesthetic and utilitarian needs of the community as regards to the ritual of worship and the exercise of the administration. Thus, during phase BD, a radical configura configuration took place. The upside of building Vita was transformed into a megaron and, and its north wall widened so as to house the sanctuary turning it from open air place to a close one. There may ha have been direct contact to a door in the portico for the exclusive entrance of the Megaros residence, while other community members would enter through the corridor on the west. The upside down building Vita <coughs> was set up with an orientation east-west it consisted of three parallel rooms, one, two, and three, and appears to have had paved floor at least in the middle one. There were two entrances, entrances symmetrically placed to the east, probably because of the large width of the building and in correspondence to the two, en two entrances, there were two doors on the west wall of room one. Those entrances permitted the communication with central room two, which through a door it would communicate with the upside room three. Perhaps a door at north wall will permit the communication with the open air worship place. Excavation evidence suggests that the room one would have two rows. That room one would ha have two rows of three or four columns, K2, K6, red color on the slide, and four columns, K3, K5, for the opening of the fireplace K4 to be housed. During the phase BD of the settlements and the second architectural phase of the Megalon, it transformed into a trapezoid building with an opposite orientation west-east. The access to the Megalon was made through a, a monumental portico. 
It consists of three rooms, but in a different arrangement. Hall three communicates to this with room one and two. In the hall, a stone base of hair, K4, off-center towards the western wall, the columns that, su that supported the housing hall in the roof, K3, K5, and at least one column, K2, remained from the previous phase, while new column, K1, K8, were added. Also, at north wall, there is a stable construction of <coughs> preparation, an early form of a mill. On its southeastern part, a smooth, a smooth red clay floor of excellent quality is preserved, with no column to interrupt it, and may be isolated with movable leather or fabric elements. Niche on the north side forming a small vestibule <coughs> with a clay bench along the east wall is also present. Because of this special feature, it seems that this space was a room possibly related to social context. About room one and two, the evidence so far suggests that they were two story. Given the large thickness of the exterior walls and the many pillars, the hall was probably very high ground floor, with a portico at the same height. If there, there was a second story, it had possible a balcony above the portico. Strophilus megaron is similar to or larger, larger than the Neolithic Megara in Thessaly Sesclo and Dimini. It also resembles to the lost large Megaron in Magula Visviki, with which, apart from the orientation of the entrance to the west, it is similar in size and shape to the central and western part. The Megaron's location, in combination with its size <coughs> and form, suggests that it was a communal building with a special role in the settlement. It served probably to the house, to the, it served probably as the house of the leader of the community, related more to the operation of the sanctuary and the administration of the settlement. Also, Hall 3 <coughs> could gather community members for decision making as there is space for 30 to 50 people or more if the doors open up to the portico. The pottery is abundant, usually in good condition beneath the floors. In the last building phase, the quantity is limited and surveys the impression that when leaving the settlement, the residents took most of their belongings with them. There are large pithy vessel of standard shapes or other vases of an original or enigmatic shape. <coughs> In terms of shapes and decorations, Strophilas's pottery finds its parallels to the Neolithic pottery of the Aegean. Establish a chronology of the final Neolithic with elements later seen at the early Cycladic culture. <coughs> the number of stone tools is impressive. 
modern griddle stone axes, chipped stone artifacts, mainly of obsidian, <coughs> but also of flint, such as large foliate points with by facial, facial flanking, and ballistic tail points with <coughs> one <coughs> The numerous bronze objects provide important information about every metallurgy in the Aegean. So far, there are 34 bronze objects, dagger, spearhead, awls, needles, tweezers, pins. These finds, along with byproducts of metal working, Suggests that in is in practice of metallurgy. A bit of coal, the very rare material, the Cyclades, probably indicates contacts with regions such as Varna and the Black Sea. <coughs> also quite impressive are fragments of stone vases and other fine artifacts indicated a high level of stone carving. There is also a variety of minor objects bone tools, shell lugs, mm -hmm. jewelry made of various material. Spittal holes document the practice of spining and cloth making, while imprints on the base of the vases provide evidence of basketry. In Strophilas, Figures were found in various materials, types, and categories. <laughs> A number of them indicate that the development of the cycladic culture had already started, and most important, fill a large part of the gap that existed until now in this field between, between the late Neolithic one and the early Cycladic one period, and for which there was limited formation. Strophilas opened a large chapter on rock card, broadening the horizons of iconography of the prehistoric Aegean. Rock card representations, usually linear and rarely figurative, many of which may be considered prehistoric, have been found scattered in many parts of Greece, in open rocky areas, rock shelters and, or caves, but not in an excavation context in order for their due dating to be substantiated. Instead, strophilas rock art representations in their maturity are directly linked to specific places and buildings during to the late Neolithic period. In some cases, at least two layers of rock art representations have been identified, proving continuous and long use of the same area and motives. Probably some of them, such as the sanctuaries, rock art, could be placed on late Neolithic one, face A, but it is certain that during the late Neolithic two, final Neolithic, Rock art had reached its peak with wide ranging, rich iconographic vocabulary, or lady form and consolidated. Pegged or carved are very shallow, barely discernible, depending on the lighting condition. In the open air, they are made more visible suddenly and surprisingly well shortly after sunrise or just before sunset, which may have given them a magic sense. When indoors, visibility would have been made possible by artificial lighting. It is clear that when they were created, <coughs> they would have more visible, while we cannot exclude the use of pigment, perhaps, perhaps white, for a more painterly effect. They are located on the facade of the wall, in the rocky area of the open air worship place, in the rocky floor of the sanctuary, and in various parts of the settlement have not yet been excavated, 
and therefore we do not know their relation to a specific area or building. It seems that they serve two basic needs of the community. The promotion of Strophilas as naval domination and the religion, which were probably directly related to the administration. A series of representations is found in the facade of the fortification wall, which was treated as a single surface in the form of an early frieze. A ship is depicted more than 20 times in a procession in successive rows or alone, moving towards the cave and may have been signed ports for the entrance to the settlement. A ship probably with a sail and the fish on this side of the cave also marks the entrance. At the central bastion, there is a representation of a flotilla of four ships, two with a flank, a scene that appears to reflect the reality of the time for a collective maritime activity, such as fishing and trade. In the White Regia, there are depictions of ships since the Paleolithic period. This, the subjects encountered in Strophilas for the first time, the Neolithic iconography of the Cyclades. Neolithic ship models were found at Aftelia and elsewhere in Greece. During early Cycladic period, <coughs> there are ship models and depiction of pottery, mainly Frank von vessels, on rock art representations, while the rock art representation from Astipalia seem to belong to the sphere of the early Cycladic culture. Most probably, it was the maritime activities that constitute Strophilus' wealth by the accumulation of the and the exchange of goods, and was what dis distinguish it as a powerful settlement. Such activities demanded community control, which adopted the use of the ship as its symbol. In this case, two powerful elements with strong symbolism were combined, the wall and the repeated image <coughs> of the ship showing the community's intention to propagandize Trophilus's power and sin domination. <coughs> Rock engravings spread all over the rocky open air worship place, area one, on the flat and smooth on the flat and smooth surfaces, horizontal or vertical especially dense near the gate. Here, in a conspicuous posi position, there is a large sack stone, a sign or marker, probably a bedding, mounted on a stone structure. Although the study of rock art in progress, However, we believe that the representations, pictorial and symbolic, suggest that the site was dedicated to a polymorphic female deity, probably the mother goddess of fertility, protector of nature, as well as community activities on land and, or land, in particular, our at sea. The goddess seemed to be declared with a sacred stone an anthropomorphic representation of her as an early form of Potnia Theron, mistress of animals, and her <coughs> symbol, the ring idol motif, depicted in various sizes and types. Her worship as goddess of fertility is indicated by the combination of her symbol, ring idol motif, with the symbols of male and female sex, the phallus and the triangle. It's possibly indicated by Neolithic gold 
object from the National Museum Neolithic Treasure. The two of them, the ring title and the phallus, are rendered to form a single symbol, perhaps one of a divinity of fertility. It seems that the abstract but highly conceptual understanding of religion began in the Neolithic period. Representation of dolphins in a mother-infant scene suggests the divine protection of maternity. The ring idol motive <coughs> is a symbol probably used in the common communication code of the time, and thus it is found in many areas. Although ring idols are rare in the Aegean, four of them were found at Strophilus. The mobile object, combined with its numerous rock art representation, shows a deeply rooted, stable, and established relationship between the inhabitants of Strophilus <coughs> and this symbol. In the early Bronze Age, apparently as part of the evolution of the religious and worship needs, which is as noted seems to have started, In the Cycladex, the schematic representation of the mother goddess, Red Gaito motif, was transformed into a large movable sucked vessel, the so-called frying pan, some of which show evidence of the female gender. It seems that the dominant quality of the goddess determined its accompanying symbols. This is suggested by a group of frying pan vessels which have on their surface the main motifs, symbols, interconnected, i.e. the ship, the fish, and the spider. The emphasis on a sea-related deity, protected of maritime activities and seafarer that appears in Strophilus' rock engravings, seems to become dominant in the islands and region of the Cyclades during the early Bronze Age. The status of the goddess as a protector of wildlife wild reveals, apart from its depiction as Podnia, the representation of deer, felines, probably jackals, boar, and marine animals such as dolphins, fish, and possibly an octopus. The relationship with the activities of the community on the land is demonstrated by the hunting of wild animals, probably jackals, and the bull. It is obvious that the pictorial program, program of the site has placed particular emphasis on the relationship with maritime activities the most productive vital sector of the community. Throughout the area, the small cavities motif, usually in spiral arrangement, the symbol of the water element and the special of the sea are scattered as a unifying element of the representations. Other symbols of the deity would undoubtedly the spiral and the meander. The dialect with the archetypal issue of perpetual renewal of life is demonstrated in a very gathered and symbolic manner on this short column. However, the dominant theme in is the settlement symbol, the curved ship depicted more than 80 times in various sizes and categories, with up to 15 schematically represented oarsmen a cabin or a time type of rudder. They give important new information about the high level of shipbuilding existed in the Neolithic Aegean. Some complex <coughs> representations probably reflect scenes of real life. For example, in this representation, the big ship accompanied by smaller ships and vessels, some of which appear to be in the safety of a rocky bay. Its divine protection may be indicated by a ring or motive. 
There is the representation with at least 50 ships, perhaps reflecting the image of a busy harbor. Some ships carry a flag, indicating a kind of organization in their activities, while one is laden with two cords, suggesting the transport or trade of animals. Only two ships, besides the oarsmen, person on board, possibly important, related to the cult. A scene with two dancers in Holmes writing perspective possibly shows dance as part of ritual art. Also, the numerous footprints, usually in pairs, indicated the human presence. Series of pairs ending to equality probably were marks of some ritual act. The large open air worship place, a very important for the community, seems to be destined for religious events untended and or watched by many people. Such events would be the invocation of the deity, ritual prayer gestures, dance and libations. It may also have had an apotropaic function for the protection of the settlement. On the contrary, it seems that the sanctuary in Area 2, at least in its last phase, could give access to a very limited number of people. The whole of the sanctuary, 100 square meters, is surrounded on its three sides by important buildings, the Megaro, upside down building 1 and building Zeta, and on the west side by a corridor. Its interior is divided into two parts and levels. In the south part, which is approximately one third of the room, there is an elevated terraced earthen white floor with a large circular stone construction at the center. A stone bench runs along the south side. In the cavity, there was a small pebble figurine, probably an offering. In the remaining space, seven square meters in area, at the level of the bedrock, the monumental rock art representation lies around a large cutting, <coughs> probably used for placing offerings. <coughs> Small cavities that are scattered, scattered around it will probably serve the same cause. Two themes dominated the representation. The ring item motive, symbol of female divinity, depicted more than 40 times in various sizes and directions, single or in groups, and small cavities in spiral arrangement, the symbol of the water element and especially the sea. The only spiral in this representation as a symbol of perpetual motion connected to the sea has a ring idol theme in the center surrounded by others. The symbol of sea and the large fish frame the large county cutting where the offer is light. The human present is reflected in the footprints repeated individual or in groups. With four ships one loaded with an animal, the maritime activities of the community are declared. There are significant differences between the rock art representation of the two sanctuaries. Here, there are no symbols or any other theme apparently related to fertility. There are also no depictions of wildlife <coughs> except for a duck directly related to water. The medium is also absent. Only, mari only marine activities are declared. It appears that the sanctuary in question would be dedicated exclusively to the goddesses worship in relation to the sea.
the complex rock art representation of Strophilas are the oldest monumental works of rock art in the Aegean and expands the perspectives of the study of this form of art as well as those of the Cycladic prehistory and iconography. The fact that there are Neolithic rock art representations at the Dryocastro settlement on Andros executed in the same technique and with the same subjects, sheep cavities, proves that it was widely used. There are extensive rock art representations in the prehistoric town of Plaka, which seems to have been abandoned during the early middle cycladic period. The technique and subjects, sheaves, footprints, regidal motifs, proves that many are contemporary with Strophilus. The apparently advanced iconography with the depiction of a human portrait surrounded by Neolithic motives attests the continuation and the enrichment of this art and by extension of iconography in general. There are also strong counterparts in terms of technique, scale, general aesthetic, individual subjects which vaguely Cycladic two representation from Corfita Renu. Well, there are also strong counterparts in terms of techniques, scale, general aesthetics, individual subject, subjects, sheep with animals, with early cycladic two representation from Corfita Lumina on Naxos. However, rock art representations from other islands soon show that this form of art continued during the early Bronze Age. <coughs> Overall, a rich iconographic vocabulary is used at Strophilus with symbolic linear and pictorial motif, as well as individual narrative scenes which appear for the first time. Many find parallels in the pictorial are of the Bronze Age, another important element that point to its beginning in Neolithic rock art representations. Furthermore, it sh shows that the prehistoric iconography of the Cyclades and wider Aegean, regardless, regardless of the material, rock, stone, pottery, metal, plaster, etc., or the related <coughs> technique of execution, 
packing, metal, plaster, etc. or the related technique of execution, retains as background basic elements of an iconographic vocabulary that was formed through time in line with cultural, technological, and other developments which are deeply rooted, at least in the final Neolithic period. <coughs> Moreover, it shows that the Neolithic artists laid the foundation of the iconographic vocabulary, a spatial management of the composite scenes long before the development of pictorial art in the mid and late Bronze Age, i.g. pottery, wall painting. Strophilas was abandoned at the end of the final Neolithic period, period, apparently not due to violent, to violent so causes. So far detected literary activity until the beginning of the early Bronze Age, an upside one, probably in relation to the sanctuary, is the ancestor Locus Sanctus. It is possible that the inhabitants moved south to the promontory of Plaka, where a large town developed in the early and middle Bronze Age. The overall evidence indicates that Strophilas was a thriving proto-urban settlement of maritime character, which undoubtedly played an important role within a wider network of smaller and or similar sized settlements during the late Neolith Neolithic period, expanding the horizon of cycladic and generally the Aegean history and iconography. The archaeological evidence demonstrates that during this period, an advanced culture took place in the Aegean with large organized maritime societies <coughs> In similar settlements of early proto urban features that presuppose the existence of a model for a complex society which led to the way into the subsequent cultural developments of the Aegean Middle and Late Broad Age. Thank you very much. Thank you.